Hello, my name is Leo and welcome to another reading of the Elder Scrolls. Today we're going to be reading a very big book, it's like 18 and a half pages. The Last Scarab of Akrash by Taba Vikwud. <laughs> is, is there other voices in this one? Yes. Okay. You'll be fine. For several warm summer days in the year third era 407, a young pretty Dunmore woman in a veil regularly visited one of the master armors in the city of Tyr. The locals decided that she was young and pretty by her figure and her po poise, though no one ever saw her face. She and the armor would retire to the back of his shop, and he would close down his business and dismiss his apprentices for a few hours. Huh. Then, at mid-afternoon, she would leave, only to return at precisely the same time the next day. As gossip goes, it was fairly meager stuff. Though what the old man was doing with such a well-dressed and attractively proportioned woman was the source of several crude jokes. After several weeks, the visit stopped, and life returned to normal in the slums of Tia. It was not until a month or two after the visits had stopped that in one of what, that in one of the many taverns in the neighborhood a young local tailor, having imbibed 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 too much sauce, asked the armor Sir, whatever happened to your lady friend? You break her heart? The armor, well aware of the rumors, simply replied she is a proper young lady of quality, and there is nothing between her and the likes of me. What was she doing at your shop every day for? asked the tavern wench, who had been dying to get the subject open. If you must know, said the armor, I was teaching her the craft. You're putting us on, laughed the tailor. No. The young lady had a particular fascination with my particular kind of artistry, the Yammer said, with a hint of pride before getting lost in the reverie. I taught her how to mend swords specifically. From all kinds of nicks and breaks, hairline fissures, cracks, pommel, cracked pommels, quillions and grips, grips. When she first started, she had no idea how to secure the grips to the tang of the blade. Well, of course, she was green to start off with. Why wouldn't she be? But she weren't afraid to get her hands dirty. This is totally not the right voice for this character. Now, whatever. <laughs> I taught her how to patch the little inlaid silver and gold filigree? Yeah. You find on really fine blades. And how to polish it. All to a mere sheen, so the blade looks like the gods just pulled it from the celestial anvil. The tavern wench and the tailor laughed out loud. No matter what he alleged, the armor was speaking of the young lady's training, as another man speaks of a long-lost love. More of the locals in the tavern would have listened to the armor's pathetic tale, but more important gossip had taken precedence. There was another murdered tra slave trader found in the center of town, gutted from fore to aft. Mm. That made six of them total in barely a fortnight. Uh, some called the killer the Liberator, but that sort of anti-slavery slavery zeal was rare among the common folk. They preferred calling him the Lopper, as several of the earlier victims had been completely beheaded. Others had been simply peripherated, sliced or gutted, but the lopper still kept his original, I don't know how to say that word, sobric. Good enough, I'm not going to look it up, I don't have time. <laughs> While the enthusiastic hooligans made bets about the condition of the next slave trader's corpse, several dozen of the surviving members of that trade were meeting at the manor house of Sergio Dress Mingar. Minigar was a minor houseman of House Dress, but a major member, member of the slave trading fraternity. Perhaps his best years were behind him, but his associates still counted on him for his wisdom. 
We need to take what we know of this lopper and search accordingly, said Mango, seated in front of his opulent half. We know he has taken an unreasonable hatred of slavery and slave traders. We know he is skilled with a blade. We know he has the stealth to, and fi finesse to execute our most well-secured brethren in their most secure abodes. It sounds to me to be an adventurer, an outlander. Surely no citizen of Moawin would strike at us like this. The slave traders nodded in agreement. An outlander seemed most likely for their troubles. It was always true. Who's saying this? Were I fifty years young, I would take down my blade across from the hearth. Mindgar made an expansive gesture to the shimmering weapon. And join you in seeking out this terror. Search him out where adventurers meet taverns and guild whores, then show him a little lopping of my own. The slave traders laughed politely. You wouldn't let us borrow your blade for the execution, I suppose, would you, Sergio? Asked Soren Jules, a young toadying slaver enthusiast. It would be an excellent use for Akrosh, sighed Minigal, but I vowed to retire her when I retired. Minigal called for his daughter, Panath, to bring the flavors more flint. But they waved the girl away. Okay. It was a night for hunting the lopper, not drinking away their troubles. Mardigar heartily approved of their devotion, particular as expensive, particularly as expensive as the liquor was getting to be. When the last of the slavers had left, the old man kissed his daughter on the head, took one last admiring look at Akrash, and tottered off to his bed. No sooner had he gone than no, sorry, no sooner had he done so than Prath had the blade off the mantle. She's the girl and was flying it across the field. Oh, flying with it across the field behind the manor house. She knew Kazgar had been waiting for her for hours in the stables. Okay. He sprang out at her from the shadows, and wrapping his strong strong fairy arms around her, he kissed her long and sweet holding him as long as he, she dared to. She finally broke away and handed him the blade. He tested its edge. The finest Kijiri swordsmith couldn't hone an edge this keen, he said, looking at his beloved with pride. And I know I nicked it up good last night. That you did, said Benetha. You must have come through an iron caress. The slavers were taught I can't, I can't do the uh, Khajiit accent. The slavers were taking, the slavers are taking precautions now, he, was, he replied. What did they say during their meetings? They think it's an outland adventure, she laughed. It didn't occur to any of them that a Khajiit slave would possess the skill to commit all these loppings. And your father doesn't suspect that it's his dear Akrash that is striking into the heart of oppression? Why would he? Every day he finds it fresh as the day before. Now I must go before anyone notices I'm gone. My nurse sometimes comes in to ask me some detail about the wedding, as if I had any choice in the matter at all. I promise you, said Grath, very seriously, you will not be forced into any marriage to cement your family's slave-dealing dynasty. The last scab, scabbard, Akrash, will be sheathed into will what? The last guy of Akarash will be sheathed into will be your father's heart. Ooh. And when you are an orphan, you can free the slaves, move to a more enlightened province, and marry who you like. Oh, I wonder who that would be! <laughs> Persa teased and raced out of the stables. Just before dawn, Perath awoke and crept out to the garden where she found Arash hidden in the bitter green vines. The edges were still relatively clean, but there were scratches vertically across the blade's surface. Another beheading, she thought. As she took 
pumice stone and patiently rubbed out the marks, finally polishing it with a solution of salt and vinegar. It was up on the mantel in pristine condition when her father came into the sitting room for his breakfast. And the news came that Kimwith Tom, Penrith's husband-to-be, had been found outside of a canton. He sat on a spike some feet away. She did not have to pretend to grieve. Her father knew she did not have she did not want to marry him. It's a shame, he said. The lad was a good slaver, but there are plenty of other young men who would appreciate an alliance with our family. What about Soinzillas? Two days later two sorry, two days nights later what? Two days nights later? Okay. So when Giles was visiting, was visited by the lopper. The struggle did not take long, but Soren had, had had armed himself with one small defense, a needle dipped in the ichor of poison plant hidden up his sleeve. After the mortal blow, he collapsed forward and struck Kosuka in the calf with a pin. By the time he made it back to the, the Mingai Manor house, he was dying. Vision blurring, he climbed up the there, to the caves of the house. Caves of the house? Sure. To Pia's window and rapped. Pia did not answer immediately, as she was in a deep, wonderful sleep, dreaming about her future with her Kajidi lover. He rapped louder, which woke up not only Pia, but also her father in the next room. Kazuka! She cried, opening up the window. The next person in the bedroom was mine guy himself. As he saw it, this slave, his property, was about to lop off the head of his daughter. His property, with his sword, his property. Okay, so, the slave's his property, the daughter is his property, the sword's his property, all equally so. Which is incorrect, but whatever. Um, anyway, as he saw it, As he saw it, oh, I already read that. Um, suddenly, with the energy of a young man, Minigar rushed out at the dying Kajit, knocking the sword out of his hand. Before Pelaya could stop him, his father had thrust the blade into her lover's heart. The excitement over, the old man dropped the sword and turned the door to call the guard. As an afterthought, it occurred to him to make certain that his daughter hadn't been injured and might require a healer. Minigar turned to her. For a moment, she felt simply disorientated, feeling the force of the blow, but not the blade itself. Then he saw the blood, and then felt the pain. Wait, what? Oh, he, he got hit too, I guess? Sure. Finally, wait, before realizing that his daughter had stabbed him with Akarash, he was dead. The blade, at last, found its scabbard. A week later, after the official investigations, the slave was buried in an unmarked grave in the manor field, and Sergio dressed Mangar found his resting place in a modest corner of the family's opulent mausoleum. A larger crowd of curious onlookers came to view the funeral of the noble slaver, whose secret life wait, or whose secret life was as the, the savage lopper of his competitors. Wait, what? Oh, so they're pitting on mine guys being the lopper, I say. The audience was respectfully quiet, though there was not a person there not imagining the final moments of the man's life. Attacking his own daughter in his madness, luckily defended by the loyal, hapless save, before turning the blade on himself. Ah, that's how that worked. Among the viewers was an old armourer, who saw for one last time the veiled young lady before she disappeared forever from Tia. Ah, uh, kind of a happy story, I, I guess. She lost a lover and her father, but eh, she's free. And that was the last uh, scabbard of Akarosh by Taba Vinmuk. And this has been another reading of the Elder Scrolls, but for now, my name is Leo, and I will see you next time.